Now we come for our scripture reading this morning to the book of Isaiah and chapter 39 at this point as we consider coming judgment upon Judah. This is no doubt a familiar passage to all of us. Envoys came from Babylon. Babylon was located in modern Iraq. And the foolish actions of the king of Judah, Hezekiah, the sober message from Isaiah who speaks to Hezekiah, and the incredible reaction by the king, showing a self-centeredness and it's a, an astounding reaction. So let us read this beginning in Isaiah 39 and verse 1. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah was pleased with them and showed them the house of his treasures, the silver and gold, the spices and precious ointment of all his armory, all that was found among his treasures, there was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, They came to me from a far country from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. I want to remind you that Isaiah is living in the 700s BC, and he's announcing something that is going to happen in 586 BC. Nevertheless, these are the offspring, these are royal blood individuals coming from Hezekiah, but it's not going to happen in Hezekiah's day. But you notice he doesn't seem all that worked up about this tragedy which is going to happen. Verse 8, so Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, at least there will be peace and truth in my days. And a remarkable, astounding statement for a man to make. As long as it doesn't happen in my time, things are fine. Now, as you can see from your outline of our study this morning, we are considering Lucifer and his fall from heaven. And I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And right before you get to the 14th chapter, we find this statement in chapter 13 that the Babylonians who were going to do this to the kingdom of Judah, that they would be punished by God for their actions. And here in Isaiah chapter 13, the Lord announces what's going to happen. And this had to do with the Medes and the Persians to governments which combined in that mighty empire References made here to the Medes, who initially were the most powerful group. Isaiah 13, verse 17, Behold, I, this is God speaking, I will stir up the Medes against them, that is, against the Babylonians, who will not regard silver, and as for gold, they will not delight in it. Also their bows will dash the young men to pieces, and they will have no pity on the fruit of the womb, their eye will not spare children. The Medes clearly were barbarians as well. 
But no, the outcome of this invasion. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. What an amazing statement given in the 700s, and all of this was fulfilled in the 500s. Now, we've read and considered point number one on our outline, coming judgment upon Judah. But now we move to point number two, the remarkable announcement of mercy. And the mercy upon Judah is already anticipated here in this 13th chapter and the fact that the Medes were going to put an end to the Babylonians. Now we come to chapter 14. This is a major reason why the Lord brought down the Babylonian Empire, why the Lord stirred up the Medes against them, and why Babylon was overthrown. The Lord does things in history, we see this repeatedly, for the sake of Israel and for the sake of His church. In this case, for the sake of Israel, so that they could return to the Holy Land. You note the map that I've given you, the three returns. You remember that the kingdom of Judah was brought down, the Jews who are represented by Jerusalem over on the left, they went into exile, 586 B.C., the temple is leveled, the government ends, they go over to modern Iraq, Babylon, and then the Medes come, and the Persians come, and overthrow the Babylonians. And that leads to these three returns. You note there, return number one, return number two, return number three, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Zerubbabel was the governor who rebuilt the temple. And so the Lord was doing all of this, taking down a government for the sake of Israel. Now we come into the 14th chapter. Here's the explanation. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will still choose Israel and settle them in their own land. That is the reason for taking down the Babylonians and raising up the Medes and the Persians. Because God is a God of mercy. And he announces he will have mercy on Jacob. We're so thankful that he is a God of mercy to us in the church. He pities his people, and he has mercy upon us. And the mercy of God, Paul picks up on this in Ephesians 2, stands behind the fact that God chose us, and God gave us the new birth. The mercy of God is behind this. He is a God of mercy. If you have problems, if you are a sinner, which you are, and you realize it, come to him, there is mercy in him, Jesus Christ. We learn here that the return from exile would include Gentiles, people like you and I, Gentiles, who decided to put their trust in the true and the living God because Israel was now starting to act the way they were supposed to act in being light, and they had turned to God in exile, and that attracts other people. If you and I will live appropriately as Christians, it will attract other people to the Lord. Notice verse 1b, the strangers will be joined with them and they will cling to the house of Jacob. Another thing is that the nations of the world at that time, particularly Cyrus and the Persians, would help Israel to return back to the land. Isaiah announces this in verse 2. Then people will take them, think Cyrus, then people will take them and bring them to their place. Now, God oftentimes reverses roles in history. And here we find that the oppressors of the Jews will become the servants and the maids of the Jews. God is interested in justice. 
We read in verse 2, And the house of Israel will possess them for servants and maids in the land of the Lord. They will take them captive, whose captives they were, and rule over their oppressors. So God is a God of mercy, but God is a God of justice. And he can bring down the high and the mighty and raise up the lowly and totally reverse roles. Now he says, as we move to verse 3, that our God, in the midst of our sorrows in this life, in the midst of our fears in this life, can give us and will give his people rest and happiness and peace. Most certainly in the world to come, in heaven and in the future kingdom, but oftentimes now in this world as well. Note verse 3. It shall come to pass in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow and from your fear and the hard bondage in which you were made to serve that you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, you, that is, you will taunt the king of Babylon, probably a reference to Belshazzar, the last king of the Babylonians. But notice this. In this life, we have these times of sorrow, these times of fear, these times of bondage. And God can take us out of that and give us rest and happiness and peace. But it's so interesting that they will taunt Belshazzar. Notice the language of their taunting in verse 4. How the oppressor has ceased, the golden city ceased. We're talking one of the great cities in the entirety of world history, Babylon. And who was behind it? Know what the text says, the Lord this is Yahweh. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers. God can bring down a government literally overnight. He did that with the Babylonians. We read about it in Daniel 5, 30 and 31. The text says that very night Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. That arrogant, blaspheming king that night was cut down by God. Darius the Mede received the kingdom. You remember how quickly the Soviet Union collapsed and Ronald Reagan was absolutely correct when he called it an evil empire. It was an atheistic empire that persecuted believers. And God took it down. Verse 6. He who struck the people in wrath, talking about the Babylonians. He who struck the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He who ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and no one hinders. Notice the role reversals. And this rejoicing at that time when the Babylonians collapsed. We read, the whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. And we have these moments in history when this happens, the collapse of Nazi Germany, the collapse of fascist Italy, the collapse of Imperial Japan, and the rejoicing that was there, the rest and the quiet and the happiness throughout the world when these evil governments collapsed. Same in those days with the Babylonians. And even the trees in Lebanon, the prophet says, would be rejoicing because they practice what's called total war. They would devastate the land and mess things up. And we read in verse 8, Indeed, the cypress trees rejoice over you, and the cedars of Lebanon saying, Since you were cut down, no woodsman has come up against us. God cut down the Babylonians. Now, those are all things 
if you and I had been living at that time in the 500s BC, we could have seen all of this happening. What we could not have seen, apart from divine revelation, is where did the soul, where did the spirit of Belshazzar go when he was slain that night by the Medes and the Persians? What happened to him? Scripture rejects naturalism and materialism and the idea that we are just material and that when we die, that's the end of our existence. Holy Scripture rejects that. For one thing, God is spirit according to Jesus Christ. He is non-material. Angels are spirit beings, and you and I, as a human being, have a spirit, a soul within us. And death means that the soul and the spirit leaves the body and goes to one of two places. Heaven or hell. Notice where Belshazzar went. And when you die, you too will go to one of two places. Notice Belshazzar that blaspheming king, verse 9. The prophet is saying that when he arrived in hell, there was an excitement on the part of the damned, the kings and the monarchs and the political authorities of the ancient world were evil who were already there. He says, hell from beneath is excited about you to meet you at your coming. It stirs up the dead for you, all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. They're just delighted that Belshazzar has joined them. And what did they say to Belshazzar when they arrived? They shall all speak and say to you, have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to Sheol and the sound of your stringed instruments. The maggot is spread under you and worms cover you. Now the day of punishment came upon Belshazzar. It's no wonder that our Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10, 28, that we ought to fear God, fear him, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Here he's referring to after the resurrection, after the second coming, referring to Gehenna, soul and body in Gehenna. The good news is that no one has to go there. Jesus Christ said, John 6, 37, the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. The one who comes acknowledges sin and seeks Jesus Christ for salvation. Jesus Christ will receive you. He will not cast you out. Now it's so interesting what is happening here. As we move into verse 12, there is a transition where the Holy Spirit bears the prophet up past the king of Babylon. He lifts his thoughts beyond history, in fact, above history and before history, to the world above. And he speaks of a greater fall than the fall of the king of Babylon. Notice what he says. You have your open Bible. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven? See, this is not a fall from the throne in Babylon. This is a fall from heaven. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. In our English translations, we have the word Lucifer, which comes from the Latin, which means light bearer. In the Hebrew, it's the word Hillel, which means shining one. The light bearer, the shining one, has fallen from heaven. Paul calls him an angel of light, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. He must have been dazzling 
as he came from the creative hand of God. He was the light bearer, the shining one, an angel of light, and he has fallen from heaven. Jesus referred to this in Luke 10, 18. He says, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. What happened to him? He was created as this wonderful being. Ezekiel 28, 17 says his heart was lifted up. We see this here in Isaiah 14 and verse 12. He explains himself. He says, for you have said in your heart. See, the sin took place deep within him. And notice he continually is saying, I will. And the idea is ascending, going upward. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, a reference to the other angels, that he will control all the angels, be above all of them. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. See, he will not render homage to the Creator, God. He knew God. He was near God. But he did not honor Him as God. And he did not give thanks to God. And Paul says that human beings do exactly the same thing. I've quoted from Romans 121. He wants to break beyond the boundary between the Creator and the creature. He was created perfect. Ezekiel 28, 15. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. He was a distinct being. Whenever you have a distinct being, there's the possibility that that distinct being will want to elevate himself and be the center of the universe. He was a being who wanted to assert the primacy of his own will. He kept saying, I will, I will, I will. Isaiah 14, 14, I will be like the Most High. Now, the result of that is that he fell from heaven. That happened a long time ago. Verse 12, how are you fallen from heaven? That happened a long time ago, O Lucifer. But you note here in verse 15, and this has not yet happened, he says, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. We learn in Revelation 20 and verse 10, the devil will be cast into the lake of fire. That has not yet happened. The problem with Lucifer, who became the devil, is that he had a misplaced love. He was turned in upon himself rather than upon the God who had blessed him with so much. He was really not thankful for what God had given him. That is a fundamental human sin, Romans 1.21, nor were thankful, Paul says. By nature, we have the same problem. We are bent in upon ourselves, and we put ourselves first, and we do not love God. I'm number one. Who cares about my neighbor? and what he thinks or feels. The wonder of the gospel is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He loved the world which was defiled and which opposed God. When we see, and Luther is correct when he said this, when we see the blood and the wounds and the death of Jesus Christ, God changes our hearts. The 
kindness of God changes us and we begin to love Him and we want Him to be at the center. Joseph Bellamy was a renowned American pastor theologian in the 18th century. And a couple years ago, I was able to go see and actually go into his house in Bethlehem, Connecticut. He studied under Jonathan Edwards and himself trained many pastors in New England. He said this, A right sight and sense of the supreme glory of God will make us esteem him. We shall be glad to see him take all honor to himself and cordially willing to take our own proper places.